Dunedin. Did I say that right? God, I've been practicing for like two weeks on that. <laughs> That's one of the difficulties. I'd like to uh, uh, thank the, the Dunedin Cultural Center for inviting us here. This, the, this Fine Arts Center, should I say, uh, from Santa Fe. And, and Director uh, uh, Georgian, thank you for having me. Um, Catherine, thank you for all the work that you did, and, and I got to thank my wife Carmela because they both did this together. I, you know, which was great. Thank you both, and uh, to Matthew, thank you so much for all your technical skills. Nathan, and, uh, Nathan. Nathan. <laughs> I see. Keep the glasses on. <laughs> uh, how many of you have been to New Mexico? Okay, well we've got a big. So I don't have to talk too much about history then, but maybe I should actually. Um, first of all, let's start off with the orale. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that word, that term. Um, it's a very Latino, Chicano term. It's a slang word. It's O-R-A-L-E with a dash on the top. Uh, orale derives from the Spanish word orar. Orar is to pray. But somehow through the years, that word took on different terms, different, uh, a different language. So in other words, I came in here and I said, Orale! And that said, hello, how's it going? What's happening? How are you? And, but then it could mean, Orale. <laughs> Images of religious uh, iconography. 
such as Our Lady of Guadalupe or different types of saints. Um, and, and so they were in, in uh, the next entryway, from 1540, they got thrown out of New Mexico by the Native Americans. And that was in 1680. So they had almost 140 years there doing great until the Native Americans threw them out. And that's the only time that any indigenous culture throughout the Americas ever defeated the Spanish. And they sent them down south of southern New Mexico. Well, in 1693, the Spanish reconquered New Mexico. And Don Diego de Vargas came back to New Mexico and took it over. But during that period of time, of 1680 to 1693, a lot of the religious iconography, the churches, priests were sacrificed, were, and the saints were burned, the, the sculptures, the artwork was burned, and some was saved by the Native Americans, but a lot of it got destroyed. So during this time, that being that the Spanish were so uh, religious, and they, they, they needed to start their own art. So the, the, the craftsmen, very primitive work that was done, as you can tell this is the 19th century, it doesn't go back as far as the 7th or the 18th century, but some of these pieces I'm going to show you, you can tell the primitive aspect of this work. And that's because these artists are pretty much just self-taught. The, the pieces are made from wood. Uh, they, can vary, they can vary from uh, aspen, cottonwood, cottonwood root, pine, and uh, it just depended on where they were. If you've been to New Mexico, you know that we're a high mountain desert, so in some areas you've got flat territory, in other areas you've got mountains and pine trees and so on. So it depends where the specific artist was working at as to the material. And then after the piece was carved, there was a, a gesso that was applied over the top, which is like a white plaster, and it covers up the seams and gives you a good base for your color. And then, of course, natural pigments are used. And this gives you a, 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 a variety of different styles that were done. And this is a later 19th century piece. And the interesting thing here, we know that the Spanish were in California, at this particular time probably, and they also came to Florida. But this specific type of this style of, of folk art was only in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. And California never had that going on, nor did Florida or um, Arizona or, or uh, Nevada. It's only in, in that little area of New Mexico that this, this style of uh, religious art was done. San Miguel. And this is a San Miguel. <laughs> now with this, here we go with my story. 410 years later, after Coronado came to New Mexico, I was born to Ben Tapia, Pauline Tapia, my older sibling, Benny, in the little village of Agua Fria, New Mexico. That was in 1950. Um, unfortunately, my father passed away when I was 18 months old. My mother had to uh, raise two boys by herself, so she had to join the workforce. And in doing that, I was raised with my grandmother, which is, um, she took care of me in my younger days, and she only spoke Spanish. Now, in our culture, my, my family roots go back 300 years, so my grandmother Still, in 1950, all the, the only language she knew was Spanish, even though English was spoken in our area at that time. And quite honestly, I think uh, Spanish was spoken there as a predominant language from, in the early 19th century, the late 19th century. And if anybody else came in, they had to learn Spanish. Now that's all totally changed. Now 
coming up there and learning English. So during this time of growing up, I grew up with my, uh, my grandmother and my mother working, and uh, I had a very difficult time going through school. Uh, primarily because I spoke Spanish and, and so I went to elementary school and I didn't do so well. In fact, I became almost like a, uh, a magician. I, I uh, learned to disappear. I had a disappearing act that wouldn't quit. And uh, that was my whole elementary school period. It was a very difficult time uh, for me. And as I got into high school, I went, ended up going to an all Christian Brothers high school by the name of St. Michael's, and I think that uh, the strictness that they had and, and uh, helped me pull myself back in, and I did well through high school. Now, when we get to my senior year, it's 1968, things are starting to change all over the United States. You have the things that are going on in the, in the, in the West Coast with the South Chavez, and uh, talking about the, the farm workers there and how bad things were there for the farm workers and there was protests on the streets and it wasn't only about the farm workers, it was about the daily life of the Latino families that were there and how financially they were deprived and how the, the, the workplace was bad for them. So they were constantly fighting these issues. And this also filtered through into New Mexico. I'm 19 years old, 20 years old. I got involved in all this. We had the land grant issues in New Mexico, which were Hispanic land grants that the, uh, the American uh, government took away from the Spanish. They honored the Native American land grants, but they did not honor the Spanish land grants. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in the streets of Santa Fe, protest signs, you know, and they were all viva la raza, one little race, and such things of that sort. And you got to remember, this is the, six, the late 60s and going into the 70s, and that was all sex rock and rock and roll, and, and uh, you know, that was that period of time, it was a great time. And during that time, I mean, thinking about my culture, and I was on the streets and I found out that I didn't know anything about my culture. Even though I was raised in it and I was living it, I did not understand my own culture. So I started to research, and even though I had been in church, my grandmother had me kneeling on my knees at church, and so on and so forth, I would see the santos or the religious iconography up on the walls, and I didn't know where that all came from. So at that age, I started to research and try to figure out what my culture was all about. And uh, I also attempted to go to college during this, home, this same time. I graduated from high school very well. And then I totally disintegrated in college. I just couldn't keep up, I couldn't uh, stay with it. So I ended up back on the streets, Villa de Rosa again, doing all that sort of stuff. And I joined the workforce and ended up working in a clothing store for many years. Found myself uh, at the age of 20 with two kids on the ground and married. But I'm still holding the banner up, right? I'm running around. And during this time, I, of re-educating myself to my culture, I got interested in carving. So I decided I wanted to try my hand at art. And I started carving and I was still working. And Little by little, people would say, oh, that's pretty nice. So I'd give it away. And then after a while, I started giving it away too much. So then I started selling pieces here and there. And, well, people would start to buy them. So little by little, I started to get a name around my little community there in Santa Fe. And at the same time, in Santa Fe, there's a market, it's called the Spanish market, that's being, that is held every year. And it, it, uh, at that point in time, there was only like about 30 artists, and they could be weavers, tin workers, um, concha people, um, wood carvers. And I was asked, I was invited to be in the market. And it was a traditional market. And I joined them, and this is one of my first pieces at that market. This is probably the second year of that. And I did very well at the market. We were kind of a hot deal there. So I decided.
decided that I was going to quit my job, which was incredible for uh, for me to do. It was kind of dumb, actually, at the time. But <laughs> having two kids on the ground and, and didn't make my ex-wife too happy. <laughs> but anyway, I did it. And on the, on the left side here, you have a traditional piece. On the right side, there I am. So I did the market, and I kept the religious forms going. I was a traditionalist. I was doing religious art, and I continued to do that for approximately about 10 years. And as I, the more research that I put into my work and finding out what these images were all about, I started to realize that there was commentary, social commentary in all these religious pieces. I mean, the easiest one that I can tell you is like the crucifixion of Christ. That wasn't, there, there was a religious purpose for that whole thing happening, but it was a political issue between the Romans and the Jews. The, the end result ended in Christ being crucified. It was a political movement. So all of these pieces that I had been doing, I realized that there was social commentary in them. So I started, and, and so I started to change my work a little bit, which consequently, I got thrown out of the Spanish market because I was not traditional now, right? Even though I was doing images that were still involving religious iconography, uh, they didn't like it that I wasn't keeping true to the line. So I got tossed out. That was another issue for a long period of time. But to show you the, the, the political statement here, San Isidro is a patron saint of the farmer the rancher. So you have San Cedar, which is the main image, and on the bottom here you can see him with his, well, it's supposed to be actually one pair of bulls or one bull, and, and, and he's plowing his fields. And the story is, is that San Isidro was not keeping his uh, prayer, uh, going to church, and so on and so forth, because he was too busy taking care of his fields. So what ended up happening is, I guess, God sent an angel to him, which is the little angel on the side over there, and, and to plow the fields for him so that San Isidro could go complete his religious obligations. And that's one of the stories. There's another one. So here I am. I'm starting to push that political commentary with my work. So I have San Isidro, and in the background you see the corn growing. The corn is dying. And he has a bucket. And in the bucket, you see the water pouring out, and it's feeding on to a golf course. And the little angels playing golf. <laughs> and what brought this whole image to me was that we started getting the gaming, com uh, gaming community into New Mexico with the Native Americans and the reservations. And all these desert reservations all of a sudden had golf courses all over the place. When we need, we're, we're a desert and we need our water. But anyway, this is one of my first social commentaries here. And again, I'm using the traditional form of, of wood carving there. My carving's gotten a little better than from the first one. I'm starting to go up. So I really started to move here. Move on. This is a, quite a few years later. Um, the San Isidro piece that you saw there, um, was done in 1997, and this one goes back, but this, I, I'm going back because this is where my social commentary really began, and what this piece is called is uh, Dos Pedro Sinales, and it's two Peters with no keys, and so you're, you're familiar with St. Peter from the gates of heaven, and he holds the keys to the gates of heaven. Well, these guys, they don't, they don't have keys. <laughs> and the other thing that happened with my work here is it's totally in the round. Because when I was carving the saints there, people would back them up into the walls. You know, and I didn't like that. So I, I, pulled it, I made the piece totally go in the round. Henry Moore's a very big, I'm a, a fan of Henry Moore's work. And I know it, looking at this and looking at Henry Moore's, it doesn't make sense. But Henry Muir had a way of developing his piece to that you had to move with it. You had to go seek it in all directions. And so when you're on the opposite side of this piece, 
you're looking in at these guys and they're looking out at you. But when you're looking at it like this, you're in there with them. So it has that, that contrary. And this is also where I started to experiment with the tattooing. You see the tattooing in the backs and, and you'll see Our Lady of Guadalupe on the back of this. This is real penitentiary art. And in the old days, you would see, uh, especially Latinos, they would have big old tattoos or Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary, or in the back of the crucifixion. Now the idea of that is actually a shield. It's what they were presenting because they wouldn't expect another Latino being in the same uh, religion to penetrate Our Lady of Guadalupe and do you in, right? So that's why they would put the tattoos on them. It was a sign of protection. Which today doesn't work. <laughs> now, we're talking about shrines. <laughs> I don't have to tell you what my shrine was at that particular time. I was a Budweiser guy. <laughs> and um, this is called Cerveza. And it's a play on the word. And uh, Cerveza. You take the first part of that word and said besa, which is C E R B E C A, and you add the R and you get besa. So besa, a kiss, is B E Z A R. So I combine the two words. So I ended up making out with my bottle. <laughs> and you can see the transition from the religious art. And the commentary is starting to change because now we got alcohol as being a, a, a major part of my life, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. There. Now, here, this is called the Pieta. Uh, and it's the mother holding her son after a gang shooting. And you can't see it very well, but in his chest, he has a tattoo of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin, on, the, on his chest. And through the center of, of the tattoo is a bullet hole, penetrating not only uh, him, but the, the image of Our Lady Guadalupe. So that is indicative of the change of, of the, the belief of the Catholic religion to what's going on today. And uh, the light, the telephone pole, is um, an image of the crucifixion. But except in this case, I use the telephone pole as being the, the, the crucifix. And the light shining down is the aurora, or that is coming down on me. This is a, a, a piece that I did after uh, I had seen a, uh, on TV a, a shooting, and this image came to me immediately because his mother was holding on to her son after he had gone shot. And then this one is called the Nascimento, or Nativity. And this goes back to all the homeless issues that we have, right? I mean, we see homeless people all over the place, and I came to thinking, well, Christ in, in, in was actually homeless when he was born. And so I have Joseph, St. Joseph. He's a, 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 probably a Vietnam veteran, right? He has the camouflage. And then the Virgin is wearing a, I forget what jersey I put on there, uh, yellow and gold. Who's a, a blue and gold and yellow? I can't remember who was. Is she? Might have been. <laughs> but she has the, the cart there full of food and the trash and so on and so forth. And again, the image of the cross on a telephone pole. And this one is called Man. Man, not man. Uh, this is Man Trapped in His Religion. Now this kind of, this piece is fairly large. Uh, it's 43 inches high and 17 and a half inches wide and 11 inches deep. And this image developed because of what was going on in the east of. Uh, 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 and 
the confrontations that we're having in the Middle East, and so on and so forth, and how man takes the religion, the church, being a whole facade, representing the church as the buildings that we build to religion, not only in the Catholic religion, it could be uh, Muslim religions, and so on and so forth. Um, but how we use the church or religion to be destructive. And the reason of his nakedness is that this man has, um, you can't identify him as anybody specifically. It, it basically means all of us are in, could be in this trap. person probably living in our neighborhoods, but it might not be this specific guy. It could be grandma next door uh, making sure the neighborhood is running accordingly. And uh, I was, during this time, I had been going back and forth to LA and I, I uh, would see a lot of the, the gang activity that was happening over there. And I would see these guys standing in the corner and they were, uh, you know, taking care of their neighborhood. But the interesting thing here, you see the tattoo, but you can't see it really well here, unfortunately, because we don't have a large screen. But we were going through a lot of issues with what to call ourselves in the Latino community. So some of us were being called Latinos, some of us were called Mexican Americans, some of us were called Spanish, Hispanic. And so this guy has a list going down his arm of the other thing that he was calling him, and there's markouts. But that wasn't the cool thing at that time, so the next thing came in, and all the way down on his whole, on his whole arm, he was running out of arm. Now, the, the, the thing now, is I'm going to start making some more changes. I started, when I was doing the traditional work, I was doing it accordingly to, um, the old ways. I was using the natural woods, I was using the gesso, and then I was trying to use uh, the natural pigments that were available. But down the line, I started to get a little smart, and I said, well, there's Hobby Lobby. <laughs> so I started to use acrylic paints on, on my work, and uh, I liked it a lot better because I can work faster with it. Uh, it's more durable on the long run, and it gives you a certain brightness of color with it. Now I'm really starting to push the commentary. <laughs> this is called Man with No Heart. And this is a pedophile piece. And this deals with the Catholic Church, specifically this particular piece. Uh, and you can see the priest, and in the center of the priest's chest is a hole that goes all the way through. On the top, you see a little child being manipulated in his head. His head flips up, and the child is dancing in his head as a puppet. What you see is an angel turns out to be the devil. And, you know, this isn't just a Catholic Church issue. Uh, this is, uh, I just heard on, um, on TV, the Mormon Church is going through this as well now. And uh, I know of Baptist churches and so on and so forth. These, and that's the thing of, in doing commentary. This isn't just commentary that I'm doing here as, as being Hispanic issues. These are issues that we have in every one of our lives. I don't care if you're white brown, black, green, orange, whatever the case may be, these, we're sharing these same issues. And for me as an artist, uh, in a way, I, I don't like to call myself an artist, I call myself a sculptor, but is to tell a story and to get the viewer to look at the piece and to try to capture him into the story. I don't have the answers to these issues. I don't. But I do have the opportunity to question these issues and to 
show that to the, the viewer and let the viewer make the comments or make them try to understand what these issues are doing to our communities. This is another one that's close to the heart. Now these images go back quite a long ways. This one is uh, called Fiesta at the Border. And I did this in 2007. And right now we're going through this whole stuff right now, today. And so I've been talking about these issues, and what you have is one side is the United States and one side of this state, and one side is Mexico. Now, here you have a, a, a Gringo family or an Anglo family having a party with a Oaxacan woman uh, taking care of them. And on the other side, you have Mexicans who are trying to get in. What you can't see on this gate is there's a lock on it. And on the top up here, it says, Welcome to the United States, but you can't get in, right? But on the other side, you can open the door and it says, Welcome to Mexico. And of course, the, the vultures on the other side sort of start to speak about all the violence and the deaths that are happening in the deserts of the where these people are dying, fighting the thousands every year to try to get to the United States. It's the real thing. <laughs> it's a 63 Cadillac. I uh, was sitting with a friend who happens to be a metal worker. And uh, an iron worker, a uh, blacksmith. He's, he can do anything with iron. And we're sitting, of course, in his studio drinking a beer. Well, I'm kind of lying, maybe more than a couple of beers. And I'm sitting there and I said, Bill, have you ever cut a car in half? And he said, no. And I said, well, do you think you can? And he said, I think so. So anyway, uh, I went out to this junkyard and I found this 63 Cadillac. And it just so happened that one, the opposite end, the driver's side, was totally trashed. And it was in a, a, back, uh, a backyard junkyard. So anyway, I had this brilliant idea of pulling this thing out and cutting it in half, well, 24 inches wide. It's 17 and a half feet long and four and a half feet wide. And I made a low rider out of it, which is now being housed at the uh, cultural, Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's a story about Santa Fe. So those of you who have been to Santa Fe, uh, again, the screen is kind of small. I can move over this way. And you have, this represents the Medusa. And this banner here, it says, Fantase. Not Santa Fe. Fantase, fantasy land, right? And so we get into fantasy land, we get caught up in the tornado here, and we, of course, are in the desert, and, and the, you have the, the, the rattlesnake, the Mexico uh, uh, seal, as you go in. And then we have Zozora. This is the piece that you're thinking about, the marionette that we burn, which is actually, what, eight feet tall? Yes. When they burn him, and he's uh, out of paper, and he's manipulated, and except I made him a cholo, which is a, you know, uh, sort of cruiser, and that's our cathedral downtown. And basically, you're in there, and you're whining, and dining, and music is playing. You see the band playing there, and it captures you. So at the end of the day, you have the web that catches you and you're lost in Santa Fe. <laughs> and you never let go. But I couldn't believe that we were driving these cars. I mean, that's 17 and a half feet long. And I had to strip everything out of this car and do a new frame on it. Um, and as it is right now today, it weighs 700 pounds, as it is there. Oh. Holy toaster. <laughs> this image, if you notice, on this side it has uh, the head of Christ, on the other side it has the Virgin Mary coming out of the toast. 
Now this image came about because you're all familiar with tortillas, right? This woman in, in I don't remember what village it was in, in New Mexico was making tortillas and she put the tortilla on the, the skillet and when it came out, my God, it was our lady Guadalupe on the tortilla. And I mean, it, she probably still has it from when I last heard and she framed it. And people were walking for miles to go see the sacred tortilla. And our Archbishop, thank God our Archbishop uh, later said, they said, well, what do you think about this holy tortilla thing? You know, what do you think? God sends messages and weird ways. And he says, well, I think God has better ways of communicating with us <laughs> than with the tortilla. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this piece belongs to the Denver Art Museum in, in Denver, Colorado. And I don't know if you've ever been to this museum. It's a fantastic museum. It's, it's huge. And uh, they purchased it. And you know how you have people make commentaries on the book of commentaries or whatever that might be. And this piece was chosen one of the most, the best pieces in the whole collection of the Denver Art Museum. And anyway, we did a film about it and the whole thing. So. Now, we've been talking about Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with Juan Diego. Juan Diego is the one that actually received the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his, on his uh, poncho. It was actually like a poncho. And uh, I brought Juan Diego up to date. So this is the Juan Diego from, from uh, let's see what I have on that. Looks like our lady Guadalupe, 
but she's not. It's my own version of the Virgin. And this is, again, the Camino de Sueños, where uh, people never make it. So the front side, Juan Diego, didn't make it. Juan Diego was the one that received the, uh, the vision, uh, the image of Lady Guadalupe. And he's represented as a skeleton down there, and the roses are dying in front of him. Incidentally, the cactus, all that is done by hand. And it took a thousand toothpicks to make those cactus <laughs> thorns. And the reason I know it took a thousand is because I bought two boxes of 250 in each box. And I cut them in half, and I had to drill all those things into the, the, the piece itself. But if you notice on her roll, it's all calaveras or skeletons, instead of the true virgin uh, has the sky, the, 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 uh, the stars, and so on on her roll, and this is all skulls. And when you turn her around, these are all the lost souls of, of the pathway to uh, the new world. And if you notice, there's an Aztec warrior here because that brings back the idea of, of, of the openness of South America, Central America, and North America. I just heard recently that they were finding from for Rick Mayan uh, artifacts here in Florida, and they're also finding Inca artifacts in Carolina, and we have Aztec artifacts in New Mexico. So this pathway that we shut down was a road that was constantly being used. There was no territory between South America to North America. It was a constant flow of people going back and forth. And when, when the, we became the United States and we shut down those, those doors, that's an, a natural flow of people. That's a, an immigrate, a, a migration of people that has been stopped. That went on for thousands of years. And then there's times you just gotta have fun. <laughs> this is called Pachuco Way. And I remember as a child when I was growing up in Santa Fe, we had the Zoot Suiters, and not a lot of them in Santa Fe, but we did have them there. And this is just a memory from my childhood of, of one of the guys that used to hang out with small green eyes. But he dressed it all up. And, you know, this was an interesting time in, in U.S. history. That, you know, in doing my research there, uh, you would hear about the, the Pachuco being a big hit in you know, California. And, and uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Zoot Suit Riots, where the military and the Zoot Suiters in the San Diego area, California area, were in constant conflict. And um, during this period of time, I found out the zoot suits were probably uh, uh, that style of clothing was brought in by the blacks in New Orleans or possibly in New York. But this culture went all over the world. There were zoot suiters in, in Germany and so on. And I never knew that. But the thing was, if you could get arrested if they caught you with these, um, this clothing because the war was going on. And it took twice as much fabric to make these, this dress as a normal suit. So the government put restrictions on what could be made and what couldn't be made. And it was like $5,000 that they got you. And that was back, back away, actually. This is another pedophile piece. This one's called uh, uh, the Black Heart. And I, I've gone back to this piece I think I've only done three pieces like uh, that deal with this imagery. It's very difficult to do, number one. Uh, but the first one, I, uh, the first two, I dealt with basically the church. And here I wanted people to see or to, to show that it's not only the church. I mean, there's temptations. Of the, the, the child in the front is, is um, what we call the. the her first communion, I don't know if you're familiar with the first communion that is given to her. So it's a time of innocence. And this child of innocence is being tempted.
connected with all sorts of different things, everything from the church to candies to toys to, you know, so on and so forth. And when you turn the piece around, that's this piece right over here, here you see. Uh, you see the souls that, have, that this black heart has taken. And they're always going to be punished for the rest of their lives for something they didn't do. You never recover from something like that. This is a, uh, I started this imagery quite a long time ago. This is called Cruising Hollywood. But I originally started this, uh, they're called dashboard altars. And this imagery, originally, I would have saints, St. Christopher's, Mary, and so on down there, and of course the, 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 the rosary and so on and so forth. That comes from my mom's 56th Ford as I was growing up. They always had like an altar put on the dashboard. <laughs> and this particular piece is uh, one of my newest ones, so I've sort of lost a lot of the religious iconography on it. This is a homage to Magu, who is a Chicano artist from uh, Los Angeles. He's the one in the center there, Gilbert Devon. He's responsible, very, well, he passed away, and he was very prominent uh, artists in, in the Hollywood area. But anyway, during this time, I had a commission in San Diego. So I went to uh, Hollywood where Magoo had a studio, and I shared his studio for a year there. And we were very close friends. So this is Hollywood. This is actually Hollywood I painted. And, uh, and I put Magoo in there, and, and the yellow car in the corner over there on the left-hand side, that's his vehicle. And uh, you notice down here in the bottom in the ashtray, there's a little pipe and a, and a, a lighter. And Magoo was very notorious for cruising down the freeways of Hollywood with his pot in his lap, his pipe in one hand and the lighter in the other, and he was manipulating his car going down. <laughs> These images, this particular image is called the Body of Barbie. And this also comes uh, from um, my time sort of like in, in, in California. The Latinas there really like to dress up, man. They dress up to the kill. And what I wanted to show here is, uh, again, uh, their Mexican heritage. And so she's wearing the Aztec headdress. And then, of course, on the back, she has a tattoo of her lady, Guadalupe, which is very Hispanic. Um, of course, I, on this particular piece, I painted the Guadalupe. That's not traditional at all in tattooing, in Latino tattooing. It should be uh, what they call black and white, or the blue. And uh, she has the rattle for the fiesta sort of stuff. And, um, but this is Barrio Barbie Azteca. This particular piece is uh, one that we have in the front cover of the book. And this is a fairly recent piece. Uh, this one uh, is called Chuy con su carga. And carga meaning burden or weight. And that's what the wheelbarrow represents. But you notice that the wheelbarrow is the world. And Chuy is a nickname for Jesus. So anybody that you know that is called Chewy, his real name is Jesus, or Jesus. And I have Chewy's landscaping here. So it's, it can be a, a dual representation. You could, you could say it's a religious piece in the form, or you could say it deals with the, the immigrants who have been caring for uh, our world. I mean, you know, here, uh, they provide food for us, they provide building and, and so on and so forth, on and on and on. And this piece is here, it's uh, Broken Promises. And it shows the, the Statue of Liberty turning into a skeleton. And she's dying and the, the freedom sign on the bottom has been broken in half. And uh, all, of the, all of the, the bones in the bottom is a representation of the people who have died in this country to make it what it was or what it is. And that's a representation of all the, the skeletons on the bottom. That's our foundation of all.
all these people from all over the world. We're a city, we're a country of immigrants, and, and uh, exceptional things with the Native Americans, of course. Uh, and those on her dress are all the immigrants that are not granted help, if you will. Excuse me, regarding this piece, I, I, this piece really touched me here, and I'm, I'm wondering why you chose that some of the faces have open mouths. Tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, this is an ofrenda, a day of the dead altar. And this is uh, six feet tall, four feet across, large piece. And this is my mom and dad down there right here. And I, I did it in a traditional uh, retablo, what we call it. It's a wooden uh, uh, board, and I painted the faces on there. But everything on this is all carved. So the bottles have been hand carved. They're life size. And that's my grandma, my grandpa in the back in that photograph. That's all hand painted. None of this is done. And then we got the chilies down here, we got tamales and so on and so forth. This is owned by the International Folk Art Museum in, in San Fe. Look very closely. <laughs>
a sign for the Latin America and just the way the Zoot Suit did? I think so. I think, you're, I think you're pretty much on it. Um, it's interesting that in Santa Fe, there's a big old conflict. It's not really that major of a conflict, but there's some argument about who, who started the lowrider yeah. uh, imagery, whether it was California or was it was in New Mexico. And these guys go at it back and forth. Uh, the, the one thing that I can uh, tell you, you see, remember earlier in, the, in my talk, I was talking about the Spanish and how they came in on their horses and they had the, um, uh, the emblems of uh, the Virgin Mary on their horse tack and so on and so forth. Well, that's sort of the continuation of that, uh, in New Mexico anyway, because a lot of the lowriders that, that are from the northern part of New Mexico have religious iconography on. They'll have Our Lady of Guadalupe on the hood of the car, or so on and so forth. But I, I, um, I um, and in California that changes. They, they, they do a different type of, of low rider. Yes? Um, so I, I really enjoyed how you talked about the tattoos being a sort of shield. And then moving through the talk, um, with the cell phones and so just looking at our culture about the sort of loss, loss of privacy and in that sense the loss of the sacred and so there's the one PA top piece and I'm wondering you know from your perspective you have been doing this for 45 years talk a little bit about the loss of the sacred in culture in general. Well you know there's some mass changes as to uh, the religious uh, imagery um, in Mexico, for instance, right now, people would always be running around and they'd have a, a crucifix on the um, you know, cross or something, or a, a, a medallion or a medal with some sort of religious iconography. So nowadays, in some of the gang situations, they have what they call the Santa Muerte, which is the holy death, which is actually a death figure that they pray to. For protection. So we've gone, they've, they're taken in a whole different realm. Religion is all of a sudden um, not what it used to be, shall we say. And I think this goes overall throughout the world. It's not only in the Latino community, but I think it's all over the world. It, it, it doesn't have the same meaning as it once did. Please, along those lines, I was very taken when I was looking through where your work has been collected because a number of places are churches that have collected your work. Is that right? Yeah. But yes. Nothing like this. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you were doing. That's when I was still doing the, the, the traditional art. That's when I was doing the traditional art. And not that I'm opposed to not doing that. If I was to ask, I probably would go into that. But it. Um, I've done several churches in California and several in, in New Mexico. Yes? Um, your, um, your art has been up here um, for at least a, a little while, and I was able to come here with my daughter, and she's a member of the Locutore tribe, the a branch of the Chippewa Indians. Uh -huh. And the, um, her great-grandparents were um, stolen by the Catholic Church and put into um, Indian missions. Um, and then my, um, my father's family suffered a lot of um, sexual abuse with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we came in here to um, view the artwork, we were, uh, we were not only deeply touched by the imagery, um, and, um, but I think that your work really represents something that continues to attempt to remain unseen um, and where it's still affecting like people today that are still living like I, I just I, I just want to acknowledge like that you your work really represents like I said something that some people try to keep hidden and and I, I really appreciate it and your your work is is really breathtaking. Thank you. Just like that acknowledgement. Thank and you very matters. much. I must say that I am working, walking a very fine line. And I do realize that some of these images are very difficult to see, and a lot of people uh, 
disagree or don't want to uh, acknowledge yeah. this image in front of them. Um, so I do walk a very fine line on this. And it's kind of interesting too because a lot of these pieces are not are owned by museums. And a lot of people in their personal homes, even though they like my work, don't want to don't buy them. And the reason is it's too much. You don't want to have a pedophile piece, this piece in your house, for instance, and you have to constantly look at it. So, so it's very easy to turn your back, but to face it. It's tough. Yeah, but it's also a really it's a it's a it's an acknowledgement. Even like your more like the the imagery that you use with like more of like the Latino community, like the exploitation of labor, and right. also like the the lack of acknowledgement that like slaves have built this country, and they still are. They still are. That's the thing that we we, that we don't see. You know, I. Um, where, where we're from in Santa Fe, it's no longer like the Mexican uh, immigrant. I mean, they're coming from Bolivia, Guatemala, they're from all over the country. And we have a, a, a homeless problem in Santa Fe, I guess we all do, all over the country. And I have not, I have yet to see a Mexican on the street corner. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I have never, and in Santa Fe, I can't speak for all over, but in Santa Fe, I have not seen a Mexican on the street corner. The other thing is, is if you talk to these guys, or with these women as well, they hold down like three different jobs at the same time. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. And because every, every immigrant, Latino immigrant that I have met in a workplace has worked very, very hard. And you do get that one that goes the wrong way. I mean, you're, you're going to have that. That's just who we are, right? I, even the Mayflower probably got a few thieves on it, right? Yeah. They haunt me every now and then. It's like that, <laughs> that first photo of the St. Michael. There's a, I was, you know, and I still do. I like keeping that naiveness in my work. I like to keep it a little bit primitive. And, uh, but I, I do push my sculpting a little bit more than I do in the early days. Oh, for sure. I meant the actual pieces. Have they ever come back to you? Like, you know, they were lost for a while. Like, you able to see them again? Yeah, they come around. In fact, I, I just, right before I came, I had a, a call on the phone of a, of a piece that somebody had purchased that was broken and they wanted to bring it by and see if I would fix it back for them. So they do come around. But, you know, it's like you go, God, I was doing that. Yeah. <laughs> 